Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. Are you excited to look at the Lakers footage I have for you? I hope so because it's a pretty stark contrast between what happened last year under Byron Scott and this year under Luke Walton. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about our friends over at SeatGeek because they've created a terrific app that will allow you to find any kind of sporting event or a concert ticket that you'd want and it gives you grades for how well the prices are rated and also a vantage point from a picture of what the seat is so you know if it's a great seat or not. So you definitely should go over there and use my code BBALL and if you go into settings and enter it there, you'll be able to save 20 bucks off your first purchase. And it makes me look good if you use my code and not Wojnarowski's or Simmons or anybody else's. So go ahead, download the SeatGeek app, check out their prices, look at the tickets, go see a game, save 20 bucks on me, and help me help you help me look good. You in? The story of the Lakers over the past several seasons is a complicated one. While the Lakers got stuck in some bad trades that threatened to take their coveted first round draft choices, they were incentivized to tank, yet had to celebrate the incredible career of Kobe Bryant at the same time. As a result, we got an incredibly unsatisfying season last year. One where we had to watch Kobe not accept his physical limitations by shooting the second most field goal attempts per 36 in his entire career and doubling the number of threes attempted per 36 to boot. On top of that, they had an old school coach in Byron Scott who didn't believe in spoon feeding information to his extremely young players. We got two minutes to make 60 points. I'm pretty sure we're gonna do this twice. In his rationale, they'd be tougher in the long run, but it didn't help to ease the pain of a trying year where it seems clear Kobe's farewell tour overshadowed the perfect opportunity they had to develop their young players in D'Angelo Russell, Julius Randle, Jordan Clarkson, and Larry Nance Jr. Looking at their offense from last year, it has two very distinct sections. To start the year off, they ran plenty of pure triangle offense with a low post entry to Hibbert that would invariably end up with the team just standing and watching and waiting till he missed. And you can see how feeding him down there over and over can affect how the young perimeter players would develop. When Kobe was out, they'd get quicker action with more movement. This is pinch post out of the triangle with a nice cut out of the corner by Nick Young for an easy jumper. And this was the corner option from the triangle, the pick and roll automatic. Russell does a nice job to read the defense and take the baseline. The triangle ultimately was abandoned somewhere around the All-Star game in favor of more vanilla NBA sets like Floppy. The problem is, there seemed to be a get it to Kobe mandate, so these sets became lopsided affairs that yielded totally stagnant offense and downright ugly shots. You can see evidence where Russell would just defer every time to Kobe to allow him to do his thing. While I acknowledge this was his last game where everyone was under orders to get Kobe's shots, the Kobe focus was a real thing all season long, like this pass right back to Kobe where he would spend 5 seconds trying to make something happen and it just generated frustration from everyone. And Kobe didn't cut down on his high volume of isolations either, and it was plays like these where you could see how his teammates weren't getting any better. And it's not to say Kobe didn't find some success with his isos. He certainly did and entertained us all with glimpses into the old Kobe. But I felt like they could have gotten him good shots in the offense, lost games to protect their pick, and also allowed Russell, Randall, and Clarkson to accelerate their development. It was no surprise to me that Russell earned his career high of 39 points in the game Kobe sat out. Here we could see glimpses of what D'Angelo could do when unleashed and aggressive. They'd run simple high pick and roll and let him find his floater game. And the offense as a whole devolved into a let me take mine, now you take yours kind of action and it allowed Russell to find a rhythm as a ball dominant point guard. You can see how he had the ability to control the possession with a knack for throwing unorthodox passes and then flowing back to the three point line to find his shot. That three point stroke really exploded in February and was very solid again in March as he began to find his comfort zone and the pace of the offense picked up a tiny bit. They even let him take his man down low to the post if he had a size advantage 
and watching this dirt leg hid the fact that he became so frustrated in January that he called out Coach Scott with his lack of communication. It was those dark days of the season that most likely led to a coaching change for the Lakers. When you look at what Coach Luke Walden has installed on offense, I can say there isn't a huge difference in the actual sets they are running compared to the second half of last year. One thing that is apparent is that the pace of the offense is much better and their spacing has opened up much bigger gaps to allow for more creativity from his players. Here's some pinch post action to the right side that flows into two-man game between Mozgov and Russell and a shot in the lane. More example of the pace, watch how quick the Lakers break right into the attack as Randall attacks on the catch, gets middle penetration, and this is fast becoming a nice tandem where they each have assisted on the other's baskets the most. Another good example of how much quicker this year's team is trying to increase pace and find cutters at the rim. And Russell's three-point shooting has become an effective weapon where there is no hesitation in his game now. He's willing to rise up and shoot it without a conscience. As you can see, Walden is still running floppy, similar to Byron Scott, only this time gets better spacing and Russell has the green light at all times. In transition, he's not particularly fast, but he's very effective and crafty to release his shot. And it looks like he'll get double the amount of post-ups this year compared to last. Russell still needs to work on his pocket passing out of the pick and roll, and rather than just throw it and hope for the best, he needs to get a better sense of when to throw it and with a lot more precision so his rollers can catch it cleanly. And there is no question he's a little three happy, probably watching Stephen Clay play under Walton, and he can clean up his decision making on a number of them to hunt out better shots with more time on the shot clock. Russell and Randall have also been developing some real chemistry on the floor, and Randall has shown good ball handling skills to the point he could develop into the Mack truck version of Lamar Odom. And on the flip side, the Randall-Russell pick and roll should be another thing worth watching as Russell has developed a nice rhythm with Randall and willing to find him on the roll often. And that brings us to the enigma that is Julius Randall, a double-double machine that has all sorts of ability despite some very real limitations. Out of this pinch post action, he can find real space to go to his preferred left side and finish by bulldozing his way to the rim. And don't overlook that he's attacking on the catch a lot better, much more decisive and it allows him to use his quickness near the basket. I love it when he can grab the tough rebound down low, then immediately push it in transition by himself. The defense is immediately under pressure and another quick attack once he gets the ball back where he can absorb the contact and can still finish softly. And his confidence and aggressiveness have both risen dramatically this year as he has shown glimpses of bringing it up the floor and going right to an isolation when he senses a mismatch. Of course, his biggest issue is the reluctance to finish with his right hand. As you can see, this would have been a better finish off the left foot and right hand to the front of the rim. And in the post, when this normally would have been a right-handed finish to the front of the rim, he still uses the left from practically behind the backboard, but finds a way to make it drop. Wow. And many of his shots become that much more difficult as he continues to favor only turning over the right shoulder for the left-handed shot. It's not to say he can't drive to his right, he certainly can do that, but he almost always finds a way to spin back left and so far it's been working for him pretty well. So what are the main takeaways when comparing the Byron Scott era to Luke Walton's offensive attack? While there are certainly similar sets they both run, it seems clear to me that the pace of the offense itself has increased dramatically, allowing the ball and the players to move much faster around the court. And the spacing has also improved, opening up the key to allow for more drives and kicks like we see in Golden State. I mean, I recognize this weave action and I'm very encouraged that they're running it, but the timing is off, taking too long to materialize, and doesn't create the same kind of opportunities that the Warriors version does. And this horn's rub is torn from the Cavaliers playbook, who took it from D'Antoni's son's teams, and is encouraging in its execution, if not for its result. While I felt the Lakers could have easily gotten through many of their growing pains with Russell, Randall, and Clarkson last year, and still honored Kobe with a farewell tour, 
We are now getting a taste of what these young Lakers can do, with the solace in the fact that Brandon Ingram will get plenty of space and leeway to find his own game, which should develop at warp speed as the season progresses. If the Lakers play it just right, this young core could make a huge jump this year, cause enough mistakes to suffer in the loss column, and add one more stud from a deep draft in 2017 when they keep their top three protected pick. If that happens, watch out as they begin to threaten teams like the Timberwolves for best young core, and it would be the first time the Lakers built a winner completely from the ground up.